Thank you so much for your patience. Welcome to our ncoronavirus.org town hall. Today we have an exciting guest, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, here speaking with Yanir Baryam, our founder. Um, we're really excited to have you all join us today. We are also striving, streaming live on Facebook. I'm going to hand it over to Yanir right now. Hi, Yanir. Hey, I'm actually going to just welcome everyone. And Nassim, maybe you'd like to start things off. I, 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 you're the one who usually give me ideas. I have no ideas. So. Well, so uh, the, the plan today is to just talk about what's going on. It's just a general town hall and to let people ask some questions about what's happening. We're, we're faced with this pretty challenging time right now where states in the U.S. and countries in Europe and other places yeah. are trying to navigate the, the, the fact that they've been locked down for a while okay, and they so, want to get yeah. back to normal. So and let and me, so there's a lot of frustration. Yeah. So let, let me tell you what my feeling is, is going on. It, it's practically impossible uh, to, to tell people, uh, listen, these are the benefits of something because they don't see the counterfactual. So uh, a lot of people complain about the lockdown. They don't know what would happen if there was no lockdown. So that, that's a basic argument. Uh, Apparently, as fools, going uh, with bring up that argument uh, quite and often. You see my point? Yeah, I, I think that uh, that's yeah. the first one. The, the second one is uh, the thing got politicized in the sense that if you like masks, then you're a Democrat. If you don't like masks then you are uh, a Trump voter. That, that's how it looks like. And it's your basic uh, uh, rights to not use masks. So the things you see start to cluster into ideas with generalization uh, of economic uh, uh, links. So this is where it's going uh, uh, rather uh, not very well, okay? No. Because the minute you politicize someone, something like Masks now are politicized. It is libertarian to not wear a mask. Well, I don't understand why it's libertarian to not wear a mask, and not uh, why is it not libertarian to go shoot people around because that's what you do in public places. And then the answer is, of course, that the libertarians have a civil rule, and uh, and of course uh, you don't want to harm others, so you're obligated, even if you're you know, especially if you're libertarian, to wear a mask because liberty is not something. Um, one dimensional, but it's a collective thing. Okay, you have liberty and then you trade liberty with others. So, so there are a lot of things that are being politicized. So it's very hard uh, to discuss what's going on, except by counterexample. For example, um, what, for instance, what we just saw, uh, the, the argument was, look, Sweden's gonna let things run. They're gonna save their economy and maybe uh, not have a lot of uh, deaths. What ended up happening is they had they're converging to about one order of magnitude more death than Norway, 10 times more. And, and we see the same drop uh, uh, in the economy there that you do elsewhere. <laughs> it's like uh, the fact is people are not going uh, to restaurants, even if restaurants are open. So, so the idea of, 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 so we have two mistakes. The first one is the economy, uh, economy versus and, and freedom on one hand, uh, the other one is the disease as if the disease did not affect the economy. And that's the first uh, uh, false economy. And, and, and then we have a second one that, uh, I mean, uh, in the mind of people who don't quite uh, get this, uh, this thing, that the, it's the government doing the lockout. When in fact, it's not. I mean, it's always preceded by the individuals. Right. Uh, in America, a lot of people have been violating it, okay? Uh, and, and a lot of people would, would just exercise the paranoia, of course. And you can see it in the data, the drop in, in restaurant receipts way preceded any kind of measure. Yeah. And, and now that they reopen some places, I am in Atlanta, Georgia, where they reopen. I can't find the restaurant open. I mean, I walk a lot. I can't find the restaurant open. So, so it, it seems to me that there are a lot of false discussions taking place. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that the the news and the discussion on the news is being targeted by, by specific efforts. Yeah, which is very shameful because the point yeah. is at times like these, you don't politicize. When you have a crisis, oh. 
you keep, you know, you go by the, the best measure and then you deal with politics later. So I like think during the war, I mean, in the middle of the Second World War, nobody came and politicized the war. You wait for the war to end and then you start uh, politicizing all you want. If there's fire in a building, you, you, you deal with the fire first and then you do other things. So, and then people tell me, well, there are different opinions. I don't understand why should these opinions about biology, transmission, spread, okay, and, ma and effectiveness of masks, why should these opinions line up to your voting uh, uh, tendencies? Correct. Okay, I, I don't see it. I don't see how they cluster. Yeah. I think that one of the things that, for me, uh, 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 when I get frustrated by the politicization, I think that I remember that one of the key things is that the community has to be responsible for its own health. And yeah, and that's localism. That. That's localism. So uh, I'm, 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 I'm st I've started reading novels, and of course, I'm reading the novel, uh, the, this one. Okay, 1400 page novel in thin paper. And, and sure enough, I've encountered quarantine in several places, and, and this was written in 1838. Yeah. And there's a fellow going to Greece, you want me now, and he said, well, it's going to take me this, plus a current quarantine going into that town, okay, and a quarantine coming back to this place. So the, the, the notion of quarantine is as old as the world. As you know from biblical sources, but I'm saying it was mostly practiced when we started having uh, globalization. And when did globalization start? It peaked with the Silk Road during the Byzantine Empire. Hence, we had the, the plague of Justinian. Okay, wow. it came with commerce, and and then we had later on a, a, a plagues coming. And typically, I mean, I hate to say it, they were coming for, on the Silk Road. Okay, for some reason, one direction, but that's maybe just uh, uh, may not be necessarily true. But but if you notice what happened throughout the Middle Ages and until uh, the First World War. Um, Towns had their own uh, quarantines. Yeah. Okay. At times, of, and it will shut down the towns. And effectively, a lot of Italian towns, when Italy had the you know autonomous uh, papal states and then autonomous, but it was much more autonomous than today. Towns would decide, and and the first thing they were concerned with was pandemics. Yeah. Okay. There was an epidemic of cholera, there was an epidemic of this, epidemic of that, but especially the the Black Plague. <laughs> which uh, so they were adapted for that and a merchant would factor in the cost of a total quarantine in the cost of goods right you see you would you factor in that for example there was that famous ship you see the plagues you know 14th century plague the second you know wave the first one was uh, during the byzantine empire 14th century plane that hit europe but in as of 1750 marseilles in france Okay, lost half his population because one of the owners of the ship was a mayor of Marseille. And he and, violated and, the quarantine. And he did, uh, refused to quarantine. Genoa refused the ship. The ship came from Sidon and went to Famagusta, Cyprus, um, and then tried to go to Italy and they refused the ship because they knew sort of like they could smell. People could smell what was going on. So, so what we're talking about is a bottom-up process historically has been applied. Some towns were wiser during the plague, and others were not. So, and I, so I think that the states in America, I'm going to make some uh, the statement that that, that that is not often made that the states in America are way too big. You got to go by cities, counties, okay, yeah. like cities, counties, some unit, and because all are not based. Uh, uh, surrounding a, 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 I mean, traditionally in, in Europe, uh, uh, there were cities, okay, cities, and then the hinterland of the city, um, and and that, that's what you had to worry about because that's where the bread, the disease, the cities, the countryside, you know, people have no social contact. So I think that in if in America we have to uh, encourage localism. But sometimes you have to walk with a mask. Sometimes you can't congregate. Sometimes, and sometimes you can't have school. Uh, eliminate the super spreaders okay uh, so this is the, the uh, you know my my idea of the day after reading uh, reading a novel and now I'm, I'm ordering a lot of books on you don't have to order books specifically on 
on diseases and uh, pandemics. You just order any book in the 19th century and you see this obsession, the maritime Mediterranean obsession with um, sieges. Right? And, I mean, they even had episodic small wars and that was priced in. Right. Commerce was, was figured now we're the first you know, a, a group of people um, I mean, it's modern economy uh, to not factor in occasional uh, crises in government projection and a lot of things. Yeah. So I think that part of the part of the question that I've been asking people, you know, I asked from the beginning, but when I we talk to sort of people who are not local in their understanding, they keep saying we can't do this. Right. This is the we can't response. But when I've talked to people who actually have engagement with local government, with local activities, they're not against it. I've found this, that there's a lot of receptivity for it. Okay, okay. so that maybe the best thing is to declare zones. Okay, and then you have alliances between zones, pretty much like uh, what's happening. What's happening now, the cleanest areas in the Mediterranean are, of course, uh, uh, Lebanon, Israel, Cyprus, and Greece. Okay, and, and in, in that Eastern Mediterranean. Well, visibly because Israel is involved, Lebanon, you know, you, you know what's going on between our two countries. So the, the nominally, but of course now, uh, what's going on is, is that they do a green zone where now you can fly from Cyprus to Israel, okay? And no quarantine if you're coming, but anybody coming, it's like the Schengen, sort of like a green zone for this. Right. And I think that, that we could probably establish something like that in the United States. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the have a green zone, call, first, call a blue yeah. zone, whatever you want to call it. First, we have to deconstruct, and then we can reconstruct. First, we have. To my my idea is is talking to Washington. You're not going to get anywhere because it gets politicized, and 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 they're all idiots anyway. Okay, so the best thing is you find may smart uh, 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 towns like you're talking to Athens, Georgia, or some other town, and look at how because people individually would agree on a policy that doesn't come from the federal government yeah this is what a lot of people fail to understand the south the south doesn't have any problem with authority they just do not want a central authority coming from washington right. particularly that washington didn't burn the place to the ground right. <laughs> i mean washington the town the the the, the government burned the the the, the so so uh, localism seems to me whatever you're talking about I've almost never seen anybody, okay, refuse the notion of localism, that you stop bottom line. Except, of course, for uh, people in Washington, D.C., and as we know, these guys are idiots, okay? So the idea of localism is you decide on the rules. You may require a test, a local test to enter the town, however you want to do it, okay? You may have your own local quarantine. You may have only, you know, allow people coming from a blue zone, green zone, however you want to call it. That can be a nice solution, uh, Yanni. Yeah, I think if people are taking responsibility and, and, and then there's also the opportunity for people to say, you know, if they only take responsible for their own situation, if they're going to make mistakes and the mistakes are going to be harmful, at least they'll only be harming themselves and a few people exactly, them, exactly. And not everybody else. That's exactly what happened during the, 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 the big plague, right. the black deaths in Europe. Uh, those who uh, opened up, they were punished. And, and of course, uh, we have the other thing. The, the people who were wiser survived. Yeah. But you cannot, you can, okay, uh, 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 my, in, my, in my opinion, libertarians must be localist, okay? Otherwise, their thing doesn't stand on the street, okay? Because you gotta have some local, if it's the individual or the family. Or, right. Or, yeah, you're, you're not completely free if you have a family. Okay, now now the family is free. No, the family is not completely free if you have neighbors. Uh, so if you have, so they're they're pretty much the, the idea is that they can accept uh, uh, localism or some form of localism. Uh, non libertarian can accept the notion of subsidiarity. I mean, e even left wing uh, people, uh, uh, mostly. I mean, the idea of uh, localism started, uh, as we want to know, with uh, with uh, the communists, one of the communes, right? Yeah. So, so, so the idea of a commune uh, as a decision unit ha is, is widespread across all the spectrum, political spectrum, and is only opposed by people who like central government. Yeah, and, and someone's talking about Switzerland. Switzerland has the cantons. The cantons have 
uh, yeah, of course, of course. areas. But, that but you, you will notice one thing is that we have to uh, figure out why did Switzerland fare so poorly compared to Norway? Yeah, that's uh, so, right. very someone may say, okay, so yeah. someone may say because ski slopes are in Switzerland. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. That's where it started. Start, the super spreader events are places where you have jet setters. They come in from 50 countries. They get the disease and they redistribute it, right? I think part so, of what happened is that people were very, you know, people got used to the idea of no borders. As we, we also the problem, in yes. In terms of borders, but yeah, Europe, Switzerland will spill, uh, spill over from Veneto and the Valdia. So that yeah. was the, the problem. What, whatever it is, the, the, the idea is Canton did not act like Canton in this. Right. Okay, too late. Okay. Too late, exactly right. Too late. Uh, Italian cities, okay, woke up and, and I, I mean, I got so much mail inviting me to speak to Italians and, and uh, I, I told them, listen, the, the charm of Italy, the, uh, I love Italy, I want to go there and be the first to go, it's very hard for Zoom, you know, to get the, you the know, aesthetics, Italy. anyway. So, so, so Italy is a, a place where you have resurgence of uh, mayoral uh, power. Yeah, but I, the, there's an issue that I didn't understand. You know, we've looked at the data on Italy for the last two, two months, right, for more. Yes. And the decline in cases has been consistent but very slow. And I, I'm trying to understand why. And one of the thoughts that I had was that, in fact, they didn't impose the borders because you see that the rest of Italy's cases did not go down until the core went down. If that was, if it was not, it was uh, yeah, okay. So what, gone what down happened? Separately. What happened? What happened is that you have first wave of people rushing to the provinces before it total up now. Yeah, bringing COVID with them, sort of like what we did in New York. You but know, it, was, it all, was over yeah. two months. That's the point. So if it went down together, even that would have been good. But what happened is that until this went down, really, it didn't uh, go down. but Italy, if you notice, continuing Italy, to... south of Florence, Italy is unaffected. There are some cases, even yeah, South Yeah, but I'm, oh, saying, yeah, I'm really. saying that it's also because you got to realize that when you talk about it, Northern Italy is, is a different country. So you got to treat Italy as two countries, north of Florence and south of, or actually north of, uh, north of Tuscany, okay, and, 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 and south of Tuscany. It's not, it's not important for us to focus on it too much, but I think that this issue of imposing the boundaries has been very largely dismissed by people in higher authority, and it really has to come from the bottom up. Exactly. I mean, think about it. If you're a, uh, uh, working for the CDC or for any kind of, uh, of uh, you know, governmental, uh, you know, central government function, you would want to resist local, uh, correct? You know, the devolution, of course. And but if you're an individual, you want to start with your house, okay? You start yes. with your house. You you're, you start with your house in my house. Nobody can come in, all right? Okay, or in my house, people must wear a mask when they come in uh, for repair, for anything. Okay, or in my house, uh, I'm free, you know, come in and, you know, bring your germs, it's free. It's, uh, so you can decide in your house. And from there, you can generalize easily to community. Yeah, I think in suburbs and in cities, it's very hard in many places to reestablish community because the communities have been deconstructed by the way the society is interacting. No, um, no, 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 we've had the resurgence of local. We have to find a way to reconstruct this. Right, yes, but yeah, yeah, the, the point uh, that we've had in America is a rise of uh, central power since the Obama days and especially through Trump, which is strange. Okay, coupled with, uh, that's for political stuff stuff we don't really care about. What we care about is the practical, coupled with a um, uh, more local involvement in town affairs, uh, school systems, and stuff like that. So, so the, uh, the, the, the mechanism is there. People communicate more via social media. Social media help people like uh, uh, concentrate uh, around the affairs of the town. And, and I know I know because I you know uh, so part of two thousand. So so I, I think that there's a consciousness and and it's very a good idea to stress that. 
Yeah. I, yeah I, I'm sorry, because of a conflict, I have another Zoom meeting yeah. with the Ruri people. So we, we can, uh, we can, we can, next time when there's a town hall, I'll be uh, available for the whole thing. Very good. So why don't we, since it's about, uh, I mean, you're welcome to stay or go. Yeah, but stay three, four more minutes. Very go good. Ahead. So you'll yeah. be here for half and then you'll go there for half. So I, I think that the, the thing that people don't understand is that there's a huge win by doing this localism from the point of view of pandemic. Because as soon as you have an area that is free of the disease, then it can go back to normal. And the other places, they can catch up whenever they're ready to catch up. And, and now that- yeah, This is why then you have to talk remote. about, okay, the best way to market it then talk about zones. Yeah. Okay, if you talk about zones, and say which zone is disease free, and then people in that zone, they wouldn't want to have people come and- uh, That's it. Know, bring them COVID. So why would you want to have anyone come into your place? They, they're going to bring in the disease. You don't have it. Or once you get rid of it, you won't have it. But uh, so, so we can talk about it in, uh, as far as the United States, we can also propose worldwide zone like Slo uh, Slovenia, Slovenia or Slovakia, one of them. Okay, I, actually, all the, the Slovenians, a Czech lot, of, a like lot that, of the countries, all in of that the area, southern they, Slavs, yeah. yeah, yeah, the southwestern uh, Slavs, uh, Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. they all did very first of all, they started with masks early, yeah, and and now they're you know, thanks, we're done, they're clear, yeah, they're. Yeah. Either they're either they're clear or they're near clear. It's one of yeah. the things that we also have to communicate. We've found that several times is that people get down to their few cases, and of course, everything is clear except for those few cases, and so they want to get back to normal. But you have to sit there for another few weeks to get to actually zero. Otherwise, you're not there yet. Unless you do, you know, you isolate. You, you yeah, can exactly. always settle with people who want to be wise about reopening. All right, you can settle them and you can tell them, okay, we have these few cases, we'll put them here. Like the Chinese did, they separated. Yeah. Uh, the Separate, but again, that's country. why you partition the country because yeah. if you have a few cases over here and none over there, then you're, you're all set to go. Yeah, okay, and, and another thing now starting to appear uh, that was not part of the discussion before is uh, a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, look at one number, namely death. So that's a bad, bad, the bad outcome is not the infection rate, is the death rate, okay? Yeah. And th they're missing, uh, uh, they were missing uh, completely the, the, the notion of morbidity. We don't know about one sixth of the people who get infected, okay, have some, something that may or may not go away, okay? Yeah, no, there's uh, a, from the a disease point. and it's, you know, very strong harm from the disease. The, yeah, so, so I mean, you can have, so and it will take us a while uh, to count these uh, um, cases, to find the bodies, so, so to speak. So it, it will take us a while because the disease is, what, four months old? Yeah. And, and, well, those, the, uh, and the bulk of the people who have recovered, okay, the, the, the weighted average of recovery is about three weeks. Uh, so we don't know, but I think because of, the, the frozen toe effect, a lot of cardiovascular problems propping up. And that will convince people yeah. uh, that it's not something that will kill your grandparents, it's something that may maim you for life. That's right, yeah. Okay, so. so. And even for children, we're finding more and more, and people are we're sending kids back yeah. to school in Europe. They're still, they're still, they're still low rate, but the fact that you have 30 times more than Kawasaki disease, yeah. Uh, is, is, is worrisome because there are other things that will, will appear later, you see. Yeah. So I mean, we're, we're now we have a catalog. All kinds yes. of organ damage is happening in this disease and somehow people think that just because you don't see it in the first uh, few weeks, it's not going to be there. And that's, it's yeah, anecdotally, I mean, I have a friend, I mean, of course, you've got to count the people who have recovered the sense of smell uh, and, and, and there's no data yet. So but anecdotally, I have this friend of mine who was among the earliest people to catch the disease. And he has a huge wine cellar. Okay. He, has a huge he keeps wine. cursing. Wine cellar, wine. Ah, uh, wine cellar, yeah. Okay, so imagine you lost your sense of smell. It's right. coming back, but not really. Okay, and he's cursing, I can't taste my wine. Right. <laughs> so, 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 so I'm saying you have to count these morbidities and yeah. make people aware of them. You, you, and some, some numbers can be exaggerated, like Kawasaki doesn't seem to affect a lot of children, okay? But the, the loss of the smell uh, 
is between one third and two thirds, you know, in the beginning, and we still don't know how many of these cases are. are, are we still are, have uh, people. Permanent. There's these stories, and we still have people that are released from hospitals, and they, a few days later they drop dead. I mean, we're yeah, I have we yeah, don't I understand how this works here. Yeah, I mean, the best thing is to talk to doctors, okay, who have uh, uh, been uh, dealing with the disease, okay. Yeah. And, and the answer and, and is, the idea, they say that these patients are really, really sick. I mean, they're yeah, really the, the, the strange thing is, the abnormal thing is, the respiratory diseases don't act that way, okay? But another thing is they, they report, they say, typically, if you start getting better, and any, uh, you get better. Here, it stays unpredictable. As you're saying, they, they say, they, they tell a person you're going to be released from... Uh, uh, from the hospital, four hours before the release, guess what, the person drops dead in a hospital. Never seen that, never seen uh, fast degradation right. like that, which, which comes from unpredictable responses by your body That's on right. top of a, a, a complicated structure That's uh, right. to the virus. So, I mean, where it goes in your brain. And stuff. So we have, it is unknown, okay, a big unknown. So, and, and, and any comparison to the flu and other things, uh, by now it's gone out the window. Absolutely. All right, Ms. One I thing we should tell the, the, the audience, when we started warning, today how many people are infected? Four million or so, whatever, millions. How many people have died? 300,000 so far right. and counting? Yep. Less morbidities. Now, when we started, how many people had died? Very, 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 very. 65. Right. 65 people were, you know, when we did our January 26, the official number is 65 people. Yeah. When you start working on our, on our, on, on our warning. Yeah. And, so, and the problem is that we have the same, the same story of people saying, hey, it's not so bad. It'll be okay. You know, and it's been the <laughs> same for three months. It is, no, so I, I can understand in the beginning people not wanting to understand, to, to, to failing to get that fat tail processes are different. Yeah. Okay. Something that in this book, someone mentioned, oh, say, oh the, the room emptied. People ran away as if someone just declared, a uh, return of a contagious disease. Right. <laughs> you see how people react in the past. They stayed paranoid, and yeah, so and, and of course that's what saved us. That's the reason we are here. Uh, both of us, our genes, you know, uh, have survived because of this early or reaction, not late or reaction. But but so I don't. But still, s someone who would have considered that overreaction in the beginning has no argument today. Yeah. You see. Um, all right, Yanir. So in, enjoy. I, I really apologize for this double, uh, double thing, double meeting, um, and, and uh, thank everyone and have, have a great day. Thank you. Thank thanks you for everyone. joining right. us. We'll see you soon. Yeah. See you. Okay. Thanks. Take Bye care. now. Take care. So, since Nassim uh, spoke for a bit, let's uh, see what people have in terms of questions. Does anybody want to speak up? And maybe we'll focus a little bit the questions on, you can ask other things also, but let's talk a little bit about localism as well. Uh, any questions, please speak up. So we had a few questions coming in from, from Facebook. Um, and that we put those in the chat. Um, would we like to invite people to open up their camera one at a time to ask, or would you like to go off the chat? Um, I think that, I don't know if we want to pull lots of questions. Let's see. Um, The, the main thing that I think that we want to be clear about, which is continuing to be very confusing for people, is that um, we really have only one exit strategy from this that makes sense. Um, people think about the disease as being a normal thing now for some reason that I don't understand. Um, and if you allow yourself to think about it as a normal, normal thing, then the extensive damage that it will cause is huge. So if you think about the number of people that have died so far in the world or in the US, it's a large number. 
but the number of people that have been infected so far is less than a percent. So every number that you're looking at would have to be multiplied by 100 if we allowed the disease to be generally in the population. And that's not just deaths, it's also the number of severe cases in hospitals and um, the number of, of uh, the amount of, of, of burden in terms of the uh, suffering that we're experiencing. So um, this is something that's hard for people to understand because you know, maybe it didn't affect you yourself or maybe it affected a friend or, or, or relative. Um, but if you multiply that by 100, the number of people that are affected, you realize that this is just an impossible situation uh, to accept this. And, and this is actually what people are talking about in terms of, quote, herd immunity, which is a, it's, a, it's actually a, just a crazy idea. I mean, it's, a, it's an idea that was cooked up in academic papers without actually thinking through what it would mean. Because here's the point. If you let the disease run through the population, you have a hundred times the sickness and death that we've seen so far. Um, and even a fraction of a percent, tiny amount was enough to, to drive everyone to realize that they had to do something about it. So it's just not possible. But then they say, well, maybe we'll just hold it lower but if you hold it lower, you're putting a huge amount of effort, right? It's like having a spring and squeezing it all the way down. This is the, the growth rate. So you go from R of somewhere four or five or something like that, depending on super spreader events, um, and you squeeze it down to one and you have to hold it really hard. So one of the things is that like Sweden is holding it as hard as Norway because it's, they're holding it constant. It's not the level, it's the rate of growth that they're holding constant. But at any rate you hold constant, you have to hold it that way for years, right? Because again, a hundredfold of what we've experienced so far and more. So you have to hold it for years in order for, at that rate, for it to get through the population if you wanted to think about herd immunity. And so you have to have all of the economic disruption that we're all exhausted with in order to be able to do that. So those two don't make real sense. And if you realize that all you have to do is push a little bit harder and the kinds of things that you have to do are make sure that people don't isolate at home and families or that you, know, you use a better form of testing. A PCR should be replaced by CT screening. We have a paper that we're about to uh, publish on this. So I've been talking about it for months. Um, and, and, and quarantines, right? Contact tracing and quarantine. And if you do that, then it's going down rapidly. And because it's going down rapidly, you wait a little bit longer than people have waited recently and you get to zero. And zero is a unique number, right? Zero is different than any other number in that anything multiplied by zero is still zero. So that's kind of the trick. You can get to zero and you can be done with it. So. I really think we need to take out the herd immunity idea from the lexicon. It's just not a, not a thing. And instead, people have, we have to realize that getting to zero is what matters. Now, if we realize that and we can do it locally, then the areas that do it locally, they're home free. They can open up store economies and so on. And the places that want to play games with fire, well, uh, we don't have to hopefully talk with them or, or we can talk with them on, on, on Zoom but we don't have to uh, cross boundaries with them so we don't have to suffer for it. Hopefully all of us will be on the side of the, the green zones, the zones that are free of the disease. So I think that answers some of the questions that I've been seeing. Um, let's, let's have some more questions. Um, I see that um, a member here, Daruba Sen, has raised his hand for a question. I'd like to invite him to, to speak. Go ahead. Jeruba, you're, you're unmuted. Yes, I just saw that I was unmuted. So I had a few questions and I'm not sure if this is the proper forum. Uh, Start one, with one. Pardon? Start with one question. Yes. So my question was <clears throat> all the data that is being, that is being discussed and thrown around they are they all relate to the reported 
COVID-19 cases, mm -hmm. not the unreported cases. And there is a European study which says the unreported cases it is 2.3, which means if there are 100 reported cases, there are 230. Yeah, let me respond to that because yeah. there's a real problem with how those studies are being done. And so I, I should explain that data because sure. people always are thinking that there's a lot that's hidden that we're not seeing. And, and the answer is that the serology tests that are being used are not reliable yet. And part of the problem is that if you have, imagine the following thing, you have prevalence in the population of half a percent, which is not untypical, maybe less, maybe two tenths of a percent is more typical in most areas. So what you have is you have some areas where you have a lot of, ca a lot of cases because of local outbreaks and other areas where you have uh, very few cases. So it, it doesn't average very well. But let's say over a big area, you have about uh, two tenths of a percent. And now imagine that you have a false positive rate of a serological test of, of 1%. The false positive rate of 1% is very small, mm -hmm. right? It's very tiny. You imagine a test that you administer to 100 people and you're wrong only once out of 100 times. That's a very small error. But in terms of the population, that's five times the population that actually has the disease. So the problem is that a small error in a serological test translates into a large multiplier in terms of what you think is going on. So these serology tests are not accurate at that level. We, so we, we really have no, um, no understanding that I would use from the serology tests at this time. And the I was actually thinking more of a yeah, but that's, that's okay. statistical I, method called capture recapture method to find yeah, out. I, the, I think of yeah. I, I think a lot of we have someone else has a question because the point is that I'm aware of these tests. We've looked at them, and in the meantime, they don't provide us with additional information. And the opposite is true when we actually have a large outbreak we see that the number of cases gets much larger than would be possible in terms of the population than those ratios would suggest. You understand? I mean, so if you say, hey, there's going to be five times as many cases, but then in a local area, you end up with a large percentage of the population getting the disease that you can rate in the normal way, then surely there can't be an additional five times the cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so all of this stuff is, the part of the problem with this is that from the beginning, there has been an effort to try to diminish the severity of the disease. Everybody, you know, there's a whole population of people that wants to interpret it. It's not that bad, so it's okay, you know, so on. So when there's errors or in, in scientific experiments, just errors, either errors because the study is a bad study or because the data is bad data or because whatever, you have this whole population of people, see, I was right, it's not so bad. And, and, and that's har harming us, it's, it's not helping us. And none of that stuff that I've seen yet is, is of any reliability. Okay. In fact, the opposite is true in terms of the fatality rates. We used to say that there was about two to 4% fatality rate, and now it's pretty clear that it's about 6%, maybe 7%. Thank so, you, Jessica. We have another question from um, Blake Ellis, if we'd like to take another question. Hey, Blake. Okay, good, I'm unmuted. Um, oh, there it is. So, yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, for the sake of everyone else being on here too, you know, I think people might have seen that uh, today there was an article that actually a week ago or so, that the FEMA and the federal government, they have a model that apparently they've been using to decide, you know, how much resources they're going to put into actually getting us to zero versus how much, you know, they're going to let things run and, you know, for the sake of the economy. And so that calculation, you know, we would probably think here is flawed, uh, but they've done some kind of calculation and they're not sharing it, it seems. Uh, 
you know, how would you propose to overwrite whatever calculation they've done and prove that we should actually get to zero if this is just sort of under wraps and locked up? I think that the, you know, again, the thing that we've been saying for months since the beginning is that there's really, there's really an obvious solution to the problem, which is acting strongly enough in order to get rid of it quickly. Part of the problem is that, you know, we, we've been in this lockdown or these semi lockdowns for a long time now. We're tired of it. And um, it's very hard for people to accept that we have to keep going with this. And, and I get it. Um, uh, the problem is that if you do something halfway, then you're, you're still faced with the same problem that you were before. We basically are in the same state. We've kind of suspended animation. We've allowed some more people to get sick, uh, but we've gotten to somehow the same state. There, New York has improved situation. They've, they've, they've crushed it down to about one fifth or less than what they had at the peak. Um, but, but, they, but, but that's still you know, at the level of a thousand cases a day. So they have a ways to go down from there in order to get to zero. And, and the point is the following, if you do it halfway, then we're stuck. The same choices that we had two months ago are the choices that we have today. The thing that nobody somehow seems to be calculating is that if you just amp it up a little bit, and it's not even that much, then you get rid of it in a few weeks. And you know, it's even less than the five weeks I said before, it's kind of two, three weeks in order to get rid of it, given the current state that we're in, we've gained a little bit because we're on the way down as opposed to being on the way up. Um, we also have a lot more testing and we know a little bit better how to stop it. Um, so the point is that if we, if we do that, then we'll get rid of it. But if we don't do it, either we'll be stuck in this, in this current state, sorry for the background noise, or we'll be increasing and that's just not acceptable. Right, I mean, there's an obvious solution. Uh, and so the question really is more, well, with that obvious solution, uh, there are people who are very adamant to not do it. Uh, what do you do? do you, and, yeah. and the answer is that's where the localism comes in. We, we, can't, we can't force people to do something that they're not willing to do. And if they're, if they're, if they're gonna be blind or if they're not gonna listen, there are two things that we can do. One is that we can the most important one is that we can find places where people will do this. And there are a few states that are doing this. A couple of them are, are kind of obvious, but it wasn't necessarily true. What, they're Alaska and Hawaii, and they're doing a good job. But Vermont is also doing a good job, and they're basically done with the disease. Hmm. So we have three states. We have a few other states that are doing pretty well. I think, is it Montana? I think Montana is doing well. Um, we can look it up. By the way, uh, Derek, who's been doing our winners pages, if you go to the U.S. states pages, you'll see, oh, I see, we have Idaho and Montana now. And Hawaii and Alaska for the states. And Vermont. So we have five. Alaska, Hawaii, Idaho, Montana, Vermont are down at the level of just a few cases. In order to be in this category, you have to have 20, less than 20 cases per day, which basically means that you could get rid of it with a little bit of a push. And so I, I think one of the things that we need to do is just make sure that those states really understand what getting the zero is about. And that gives us a huge advantage because if they're successful, then hopefully other states will realize that they should emulate what they've done. Great, thanks. Um, shall we take another call from someone raising their hand? Sure, please. All right, Sebastian Mellon. Um, hi there, can you hear me all right? Yes. Hi there. Um, Sebastian. My question really relates a little bit more about, uh, about mask usage and uh, what, the, what your opinion is on, on the usage of masks, whether that can actually help in terms of infection rates when we're talking about, you know, go grocery store or something like that, which has to happen, even if you're in a very strict lockdown, as far as I see it, right? Yeah. So first yes. of all, the best thing to do is not to go into the grocery store. Okay. 
Right. So you get delivery or you get do drive by pickup. Sure. Yeah. And why go in if you don't have to, right? The best. Right. Thing. Right. And so if they're not doing it around you, try to uh, instigate that they will do that. Gotcha. Okay. Um, now, let's say there is a store that you that they don't provide drive by pickup. Sure. The one thing that you can do is you can call them up and say, look, you know, I really would prefer it if someone would step outside and drop it into my trunk. Sure. Okay. Gotcha. So yes. avoiding going in is, is a really good idea. Yeah. yeah. Now, let's say you do have to go in for some reason. Mm -hmm. Absolutely wear a mask. Sure. Okay. So mask is a filter. Remember, everything about this disease is about transmission. Right. If you're transmitting right. from one person breathing out or coughing or sneezing, then, then the whole point is that you don't want it getting into your nose or your mouth. Right. 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 So what is the mask? It's a filter. Sure. It's not a perfect yeah. filter because stuff yeah. may be getting out, but you really want to clamp it down so that it's as good a filter as you can make it. Right. The other place you can get it through your eyes. That's why people need to wear goggles and PPEs. They wear mat, you know, they wear these um, shields. Face shields are, yeah. Shields. Yeah. And so everything um, that prevents it from getting onto you and also obviously if everyone else is wearing a mask, which you want them to do. Right. Then right. if they cough or sneeze or breathe out, there's a filter on the way out. So yes. you have two filters, a filter on the way out and a filter on the way in. Right. And then if I can just ask one short follow-up question, what do you think of, strategies like taping the mask to the side of your face. I've seen some people suggest this or uh, maybe using salt coated masks. There was a study which was published in Nature uh, yeah. uh, using essentially a salt crystallization layer to deactivate viruses. Yeah. So, yeah. so in terms of taping it to your face, it depends, you know, whether you can tolerate that. But yeah, closing sure. up the sealing up the, the gaps is not a bad idea. Right. Um, uh, you know, part of the problem is that any of these things may, may, you have to be careful, right? Because if you use it a lot, then you'll damage your skin. And, and that's yeah, yeah. good because you'll, you'll create um, uh, vulnerable like sores. Right, sores that may yeah. Yeah, yeah. If it's like you do it once a week, you know, yeah. But if you did it every day, I, I don't know if that would work. Sure. Yeah, I've seen that in some child doctors and stuff. Yeah. It, it may be better to get a, a shield. Okay, gotcha. Right. And then in terms of the salt, um, I think there's a, there is some concern that I have about sort of breathing in the salt. So one has to, it's better if, if it's on the exhaust and not on the entry. Sure, um, sure. But I don't know what the, it depends upon the circumstances, whether that's a good choice or not. I don't really right. know how to evaluate. Sure. I sent a link to the, to the nature study there. Oops, sorry. I'll send it yeah, to everyone no, here. If they I want to know about okay. the salt though. Okay, gotcha. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, we had a, a related question in the chat about perhaps wearing goggles or glasses if one had to go on an airplane. Yeah. So going on an airplane is a whole other story. Um, um, if you absolutely positively have to go on an airplane, um, wearing whatever you can as a protection makes sense. We used to be concerned about just opening up the vent because if you open the vent, the airflow comes from a part of the airflow, at least comes from a, um, uh, the outside. Uh, so, and it's, and it's supposed to be filtered air, but I don't know if it's HEPA filtered air, which would be really good for the airlines to do. Uh, but in general, um, uh, we haven't set up a protocol for flying on airplanes because it's too scary to think about if you have to go, right? Because it's, right. it's pretty risky. Great. Thank you. We have another participant raising their hand, Oliveris. I'm going to unmute them and, and ask them to share their video. Oliveris Garcia, are you here? Um, yes. Hello. Hi. Hi. Miss, uh, one question I have is when uh, we do these rankings of... Uh, winners, uh, say Idaho, uh, and would say like uh, states that need improvement like uh, Georgia, we could say the same about the European countries like uh, um, Spain uh, needing improvement and uh, uh, Slovenia doing great work. Uh, question is, uh, I wonder myself is if we are being fair, 
in, the, in saying that one country is a winner and another one uh, needs improvement and what uh, are like structural causes that may have led uh, these countries like Idaho having better performance uh, than um, Georgia out of sure. randomness or uh, of Georgia being more connected through the Atlanta airport, etc. Our concern, we're aware that, the, the, I mean, the question is, what is the competition about? And the competition is about getting to zero to a healthy state. And if you start at a disadvantage, it still requires us to get to the healthy state in order to be, I mean, Spain and Italy have done an incredible amount in order to reduce the number of cases there. Really incredible amount. They've gone from huge numbers of cases, like Spain had 6,000 cases per day or more. In Italy, it was, if I remember, about 4,000, maybe three to 4,000 at least. And since then, they're down at about 1,000 or under 1,000 now per day. So you say, well, they've done a huge amount. Doesn't that mean they're winners? And the answer is no, they've got to get to under 10 or 20 cases in order to be considered winners because that's the only time at which we'll really be able to say that they're getting out of this disease. So that's the criteria. It's not about, you know, I mean, yeah, highly connected spots are at a quote disadvantage, but you know, also countries that acted earlier are at an advantage. So there's a decision-making that matters. But one of the things to realize is that any place, absolutely any place with a really strong action, and there are a number of countries that are highly connected and very vulnerable and took really strong actions. And within a few weeks, like five weeks, which is what we've said, these peaks have gotten to zero. So in that sense, everyone's in the same situation. Um, so even though there are, you know, Idaho and New York are in different situation because Idaho has a dispersed population, New York has a large population. If New York had taken very strong action and if Idaho had taken strong action, they would have both be at zero. Does that help? Thank you, Olivares. Um, we have uh, Eugene up next. Eugene, I invite okay, you to. Can, Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can... So th this is obviously a dilemma. If one person started this in China somewhere or wherever it is, when you go down to 20, they can still keep it going. And Idaho, for example, is an open situation versus a closed situation, which New York sort of is. But nowhere in the United States is it really closed because we have a huge infrastructure just to feed us. So it, it seems like we have a real dilemma. Maybe you could address that. Sure. It turns out that to close a space, you don't have to stop essential travel. And we have a whole bunch of guidelines about how to do it. So let's say you're in Idaho and you want to get to zero, you, or you're, you're at zero. You, you don't want people along the highway to, to do stuff that's going to get you to be sick again. Is that clear? Sure. So what do you do? And the answer is you have to make sure that the through traffic has only access to areas that are protected along the highway. So you have rest stops that you handle in a very careful way so that through traffic doesn't leave, give you rise to new cases in the state. And then the other thing that you do is that you make sure that anyone coming into the state, if they want to come into the state, and this is done in many countries around the world right now, is they have to quarantine for 14 days. And we're not used to thinking that way, but that's the whole point. And you can do it town by town. So in Alaska, by the way, they don't allow people to go from one town to another town or one city to a town or a town to a city. The whole city is, the whole state is quarantined. Now, that's easy, it's easier to do in Alaska maybe than it is in New York State or in Massachusetts or, you know, say Georgia. But it's not impossible. And when I talk to people about doing it, they realize that it's not impossible. 
I think it's very difficult, though. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but remember, we're not fighting a softy here. It's like, you know, you, you're going into the ring against, you know, a real enemy. No, I, I totally agree with you on that. That's there's it. No, there's, a, there's another question, though. Yeah. It, 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 might, it might come back. What what is soon? Why do you want no, it's, it? this it, one is this is this is one of those you know, this is one of those modeling assumptions that people make. So th remember that most of the people that are epidemiologists, they study human diseases. And what do human diseases do? They come back. That's why it's a human. They call it a human disease because it goes around and around in the population. So when they make models like the Imperial College model, they stick into the model that it's going to come back. Their assumptions are about it's coming back. But I, I work on outbreaks like Ebola and SARS, but I work particularly on Ebola. And you think Ebola has been around for a while, it came back. No, it didn't come back. Those were new introductions. Every time it was introduced, we got rid of it. And this disease is like that too. It's it's really possible, we know. I mean, the point is that if it grows exponentially really fast and you can make it go down exponentially really fast, then you know you can get it to zero. There's no doubt. And people have already gotten it to go to zero. So if you can get it to go to zero, remember zero times any number is still zero. It's extinct. We didn't have this disease 12 months ago. And it's not, it's not here because it came back. So in a few months, this disease could also be gone entirely, and then it would not come back. And, and, and going back to this kind of idea, and we're gonna stop, I guess, in a few minutes because this is the end of the, of the session, but this is one of the most important things that people have a hard time understanding from the beginning. In the beginning, we didn't have this disease. The world was a normal place. All of our lives, we lived in a certain way of living. And so it was really hard for us, Nassim and I and, and Joe Norman, when we wrote our paper, to influence people because, not because they didn't hear about this disease in China, but because in their minds, they thought that the normal life would never be disrupted. And now we see that it's disrupted. So the amazing thing for me is that today, everyone is thinking, hey, it's going to be this way forever. This is the, quote, new normal. So now a lot, a lot of people are saying, hey, well, if we suppress it, it'll just come back. Why? Because this is the new normal. No, it doesn't have to be that way. We can totally get rid of this disease and totally go back to the other normal that we used to be in. So why don't I take one very quick last question? And then we'll close up. We have our last question waiting here patiently from Elir Shiraj. Um, hello. Hi. Hi, Thank Elir. You. How are you? Um, so uh, actually, I'm outside of the United States, so I want to ask something completely different. From Please. Me. So uh, well, we know very well that you know the spread, of, the speed of the spread of disease is actually based too much on the population density. So uh, my country, actually, I'm originally from Albania, is like three million people totally and like one million of them are actually concentrated on the capital. So we've been almost on eight weeks lockdown. Yeah. And still there are, you know, like three cases or four cases a day as a mean. I mean, does this country need to continue on a lockdown for the cases to get zero? It's almost impossible. The, I mean. the answer is once you're down to a few cases, it turns out that what you need to do is kind of pounce on it. You really need to figure out why, where those cases are coming from. Because you have all of these resources of the entire country, you want to get rid of this. So you really want to focus on figuring out why those cases are there. And so if you wanted my, you know, if you wanted my advice, I mean, I'm sure they're doing maps. There was over here, over there. And once yeah. you figure out why those cases are there, you can get rid of them totally. And there are some strategies that people are not using. And this is one of the frustrations for me. In China and in some other countries, they've been very successful in using CT scans. I mentioned this earlier. Yeah. Because you can detect cases at the time of symptoms 
Right now, using RT-PCR, there are 30% false negatives. So what happens is someone has a case, someone has symptoms, and you test them, and you tell them, no, you don't have the case. They go home, they interact with their family and friends, and they go to work in essential services, and they get other people sick. You see? So, and you didn't know about it, right? Because, and, and people think that there are these asymptomatic carriers. It's not mostly, probably, like, it's probably uh, these false negatives. Yeah, so, so I mean, all those. so like if you have a whole country, you know, so we know exactly where most, most of the cases are coming from. There are like two or three cities, while from the rest of the country, there's nothing coming up actually. So the problem is that the government is like locking down everything. Right. So this is why we talk about the localism. Localism, exactly. Localism doesn't just have to be because of local decision. It can also be the government that says, hey, we can release... 80, 90% of the country to be normal, we'll just keep the lockdowns in these few places and we'll make sure that we do the precautions about going across the boundary. And that's a huge win. So we've been trying to advocate that, but there is this, there is a structural problem that people think that the transportation is always kind of essential. But once you're in a lockdown, there's not that much essential travel. And it so has we, been on lockdown for eight weeks, I mean, and it's crazy. It. Like, people are get getting frustrated because the economy is biting very badly. Right. But the point is that if we can get this idea that you can do zones, then it frees up a lot of capability because you can relax the economic restrictions and still be safe. And so that's the word that we're trying to get out and help us get it out. Tell everybody that what we really need to do is do zones and maybe someone who has the ability to, to set them up will, will listen. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. It's been nice. It was fun to have Nassim join us and I'm looking forward to him joining us again. Um, and remember, it, this is not the new normal. It's just... Thing that's happening now and uh, we should be able to defeat this disease and if there are some places that decide they want this to be the new normal we can let them have it uh, everybody else hopefully will be will be free of it and and hopefully sooner than than later thank you very much for joining thanks everybody for coming there are links in the chat to join us on facebook twitter discourse Slack or my email address if you need help navigating anything. We'd love to keep you involved. There's plenty of work to do to, to end the coronavirus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye.